Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from UPSC Civil Services Examination Perspective. Now today we are taking the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 23rd February 2023 and the important news to be discussed has been displayed on your screen. Now let's start our discussion with this very important article appearing on page number 6. And it says that protect the power of the little man in a democracy. Now this article highlights very important aspects with respect to the role of majoritarian government, the role of opposition members and also the relation of a political party with that of the citizens because ultimately in a democracy it is a citizen who vote for a particular party who then forms the government if they have the majority. So here the author who is also a senior lawyer has highlighted certain concerns with respect to this present government and he has highlighted the concerns with respect to the role of opposition members as he has highlighted that the government is silencing the role of opposition and through this the democratic values, norms and precedents or parliamentary practice are in danger. So here the role of opposition party in a government becomes important. So this whole idea has been highlighted with respect to this political spectrum where on one side is the dictatorial approach of the majoritarian government, whereas on the other end of the spectrum is the role of strong opposition. So clearly if there is a dictatorial approach of the majoritarian government, irrespective of which political party is in power, then the role of opposition diminishes. And this diminishing role of the opposition impacts democratic values and also norms. So the role of opposition in any government becomes very important because it provides checks and balance on the various policies and programs of the government. And it is because of this, the leader of the opposition has been recognized through a law, namely the salary and allowances of leaders of opposition in Parliament Act of 1997. So basically this law in a way gives statutory recognition to the leader of opposition. Now section 2 of this law defines leader of opposition and this definition is in relation to either house of parliament that is Lok Sabha or Rat Sabha and it says that leader of opposition in relation to either house of the parliament means that a member of the council of states or of the house of the people for the time being the leader in that house of the party in opposition to the government having greatest numerical strength recognized as such by the chairman of Rat Sabha or the speaker of Lok Sabha. So the leader of opposition has to be recognized by the speaker of Lok Sabha or by the council of states and through this particular law namely the salary and allowances of leaders of opposition in parliament act 1977 it has given statutory recognition to the leader of opposition both in Lok Sabha and also in Raj Sabha. And section 3 of this particular law provides for salary to the leader of opposition. So it says that each leader of opposition that is each in Lok Sabha and Ras Sabha so long as they continue to be such a leader shall be entitled to receive a salary as per mensim and allowance for each day at the same rates which are specified in section 3 of salary allowances and pension of members of parliament act of 1954. So their salary is also statutorily provided. So effectively the Indian parliament has given statutory recognition to the leader of opposition and it is here where the role of opposition through its leader becomes very important while both the houses are in session. Now talking about political parties and particularly the opposition and also the government in power then here we need to understand the role of political party in a democratic setup like India. Now we know that India is a multi-party system. It means that there are various political parties who fight elections both at the state level and also at the national level. Now when we talk about our democratic setup then it's important to understand that there is an intrinsic link between political parties and a vibrant democracy and this link is provided by we the people of India that is Indian citizens because ultimately it is the Indian citizens who vote for a particular political party based on their ideas, their ideologies and also their vision or roadmap which they intend to provide through the election manifesto. And this intrinsic link between political parties and democratic values and democratic practice is reflected through various indicators of democracy such as people's participation in decision making process, 
basically voting done by people during any election political mobilization of the people by the political parties based on their ideas their ideologies their visions and other aspects political parties through their visions and ideas also generate political consciousness among people and in a way politically mobilize them and all of these is done by articulating people's issues or various needs either at regional level or at national level further political parties also provides vision to meet needs of the people and all this is done by the political parties by fielding various candidates at respective election at state and national level so ultimately it's the indian citizens which ensures this intrinsic link between political parties and a healthy democratic practice as has been done in india after independence now other concerns highlighted by the author is with respect to misuse of government agencies for political benefits especially in opposition ruled states now this affects or impacts center state relationship and further deteriorates their relation especially in those states where it is ruled by opposition parties so here the author highlights that this dictatorial approach by the central government impacts indian federalism as it also subverts constitutional practice and also the constitutional spirit and constitutionalism now when we talk about constitutional spirit or constitutionalism it simply means following the letters of the law as provided in the indian constitution and it is in this regard the author suggests that there is also need to nurture constitutional morality which also means following the tenets of indian constitution as constitutionalism also means limited government as they are not only limited by the laws of the land that is the constitution or other laws but they are also limited by the role of opposition in the parliament or state assemblies because it is the duty of the opposition to ask questions from the government on implementation of various schemes or policies of the government and for this purpose various parliamentary tools have been provided and according to article 75 clause 3 it is the executive which remains accountable to the legislature and it is here where the role of opposition party or the role of opposition members becomes very important in a democratic setup now very briefly let us go through these questions asked by upsc in the prelims of 2020 and 2017 so this question is a parliamentary system of government is one in which the options given were a all political parties in the parliament are represented in the government b the government is responsible to the parliament and can be removed by it c the government is elected by the people and can be removed by the people and d the government is chosen by the parliament but cannot be removed by it before completion of a fixed term so here the correct answer becomes b because ultimately the government remains responsible to the parliament or to the legislature now this question is with respect to limited government and it says a constitutional government by definition is a the correct answer here is a limited government and not government by legislature or popular government or multi party government now coming to some of the questions asked by upsc in 2017 look into this question it says democracy's superior virtue lies in the fact that it calls into activity options given here was a the intelligence and character of ordinary men and women b the methods for strengthening executive leadership c a superior individual with dynamism and vision and d a band of dedicated party workers now democracy cannot exist without the people or without the citizens of a country and ultimately it is the decision making of the citizen or the people with respect to their choices which is reflected through voting to different political parties so here the correct answer becomes a that is intelligence and character of ordinary men and women which is reflected through their voting process this question was the main advantage of parliamentary form of government is that options are a the executive and legislature work independently b it provides continuity of policy and is more efficient c the executive remains responsible to the legislature and d the head of the government cannot be changed without election now again this idea of the executive remaining responsible to the legislature is again asked by upsc in the same year so here the correct answer becomes c that is the executive remains responsible to the legislature now coming to the tools through which parliament exercises control over the executive 
this question was asked so it says that the parliament of india exercises control over the functions of the council of ministers through options given were adjournment motion question r and supplementary questions so here the correct answer is all of these and also other aspects including no confidence motion because it is through these parliamentary tools the parliament ultimately controls the executive so here the correct answer becomes d now this discussion becomes important from the perspective of gs paper 2 particularly indian constitution and its significant features and also amendments and also the role of various groups and association which also includes political parties so with respect to our discussion let's take up these two questions asked by upsc in the mains of 2021 and 2022 so the question asked in 21 is constitutional morality is rooted in the constitution itself and is founded on its essential facets explain the doctrine of constitutional morality with the help of relevant judicial decisions so here we need to explain this doctrine of constitutional morality along with judicial decisions so it is basically asking that how the various supreme court judgments has helped the government to ensure constitutional practice or not to deviate from the provisions of the constitution the next question is with respect to political parties asked last year in the mains of 2022 this question is while the national political parties in india favor centralization the regional political parties are in favor of state autonomy comment this question carried 15 marks so it's important to understand both the aspect of constitutional morality and also the role of political parties both the political party in power and also the political party in opposition regarding its importance in our whole democratic setup now talking about political party so we can say that political party forms an important component of a political system a political party is an institution which consists of leaders followers policies and programs and ncert highlights that a political party is a group of people who come together to contest election so contesting election is one of the basic aspect of a political party and by winning those election hold power in the government it further says that political parties agree on certain policies and programs for the society with a view to promote collective good so the political party along with its winning or losing election also holds a relationship with indian society and through its policies and programs meets various needs aspiration or other requirements of members of the indian society and members of indian society particularly indian citizens then based on those ideologies vote for any given political party or different political parties so it says that since there can be different views on what is good for all parties try to persuade people why their policies are better than the others it's sort of a competition among political parties with respect to their ideas their ideologies their policies and also their programs and based on these competing ideologies and programs they seek to implement these policies by winning popular support through elections so it highlights that thus political parties reflect fundamental political divisions in a society parties are about a part of society and thus involve partisanship so a party is known by which part it stands for which policies it supports and whose interest it upholds a political party has three components its leaders active members and also followers so there is formal membership for a political party for example you or me can become a formal member of a political party or we do not become a formal member of a political party but we may have certain understandings about the ideologies or programs of any given political party so overall important role played by political party includes they contest elections they put forward different policies and programs and the voters choose from those different or competing policies and programs of different political parties political parties play a decisive role in making laws for the country political parties form and run the governments by winning elections they shape public opinion by raising and highlighting various issues having regional or national importance political parties provide people access to government machinery and welfare schemes implemented by their governments so overall these can be said to be the important role played by the political parties so coming to this question asked by upsc in 2022 it was asking that why national party favors centralization whereas state party favors autonomy or is against centralization 
So here you had to give reasons for both aspects as to why the national political parties favor centralization and why states prefer autonomy. Now let's look into a sample answer for this particular question. So here it highlights with an introduction which says that Indian parliamentary democracy has favored a multi-party system where political parties are recognized by election commission as national or regional parties based on percentage of votes garnered and seats won in parliamentary or assembly election. This is the crux or the basics with respect to recognition of a political party either as national party or as state political party. Now here it is important to understand that election commission has been empowered to recognize any political parties either as national political party or as state political party according to the election symbols reservation and allotment order of 1968. So this order empowers the election commission to allot symbols at elections in parliamentary and assembly constituencies, recognizing political parties and also suspending or withdrawing recognition of recognized or unrecognized political party for its failure to observe model code of conduct or any other lawful instructions or legal instructions provided by election commission. Now from your prelims perspective what you need to know is the conditions provided for any political party to be recognized as state party. So the first condition is that at the last general elections to the state legislative assembly securing not less than 6% of the total valid votes plus winning at least two seats in the state legislative assembly. At the last general election to the Lok Sabha from the state securing not less than 6% of the total valid votes polled in the state plus win at least one seat in Lok Sabha election from the state. Next, at the last general election to the state legislative assembly party winning at least 3% of the total number of seats in the legislative assembly or at least 3 seats in the legislative assembly whichever is more or at the last general election to the Lok Sabha from the state win at least one for every 25 seats from the a state in Lok Sabha election or a political party securing at least 8% of the total valid votes polled in the state. Now the political parties needs to fulfill either of these criteria and not all of these criteria. Now coming to the conditions for recognition of a political party as a national political party. The condition states securing at least 6% of the valid vote in assembly or Lok Sabha general election in any four or more states and have won at least four seats in Lok Sabha general election from any state or states or win at least 2% of the total Lok Sabha seats and these seats must be won from three different states. Next party is recognized as a state party in at least four states and here the latest addition to the list of national party includes All India Trinamool Congress. So effectively based on the winning of various seats provided under these conditions a political party can be recognized either as a state party or can be recognized as a national party. And as you can see that a political party having greater presence in different states and also in the Lok Sabha such parties recognized as a national party and these national parties have a very different outlook as compared to the state parties. And this is what the question was asking in the mains examination. And this is where the political agendas of national and state parties differ because of the recognition by the election commission either as national party of course they would be having larger voter base or larger presence in the country as compared to state political parties whose presence and also seats are limited. So it says that this differentiation of a national and a state political parties it is here where their political agendas differ and this is also based on their voter base and their respective demands. Now the policies and programs of a national party will have a larger audience, will have a larger appeal and will cater into various aspects of national importance whereas state political parties would be limited to their respective state where they are elected by their respective people. So coming to the first part of the answer as to why regional parties favor state autonomy because of political and social reasons, because of financial reasons and also because of administrative reasons. So coming to the political and social reasons, the first reason is regional presence of these political parties having small voter base and social engineering technique basically based on caste based politics to attract caste based voters. Example DMK in Tamil Nadu passing bills against NEET, demand for caste based census by RJD and JDU in Bihar etc. So their presence and also their voter base is limited 
and because of this their policies differ as compared to national party and because of this they favor autonomy the second reason is the financial reason here it mentions about devolution of finance by center is tied with conditionalities so states have certain compulsions regarding spending some of the central funds centrally sponsored schemes mandate part of expenditure by states but take away autonomy and because of this some of the states like west bengal telangana and odisha have withdrawn from pmj or pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana regional parties in poorer states have demanded special status because of poor avenues of growth and because of these financial reasons state parties having limited voter base demand state autonomy coming to the administrative reasons it mentions about misuse of concurrent list by the national parties at center misuse of central agencies such as all india service officers misuse of agencies like cbi ed income tax etc and also politicization of the offices of the governor especially in opposition ruled states so these are the reasons as to why regional parties favor state autonomy now coming to the other half of the question as to why national parties favor centralization here also the reasons are political financial and administrative political reasons they have larger voter base and of course national presence that is larger presence as compared to the state political parties and agendas and priorities of political parties differ from regional parties and favor issues such as simultaneous elections now the issue of simultaneous election has been opposed mainly by smaller parties or state parties because they understand that under this idea of simultaneous election the regional aspects may be swept away putting them at a great disadvantage and this is also another reason why state parties are against centralization another reason is financial obviously center has greater financial control with respect to annual budget recommendations of finance commission etc as center is not supposed to share the surcharge imposed under article 271 and the center can also limit borrowings by state under article 293 of the indian constitution so basically the constitution also empowers the central government or the national parties who forms government at the center to regulate the state political parties another reason is attracting greater political funding from corporates because even corporates wants to spend on those political parties from whom they can ask any favor now another reason is administrative reason now even the constitution of india has favored or provided for a strong center but with states autonomy or states independence but overall it has strengthened policies and programs of the national parties effectively giving greater control over the state political parties because in some states it is the state political parties who forms the government another administrative reason is that governor functions as an agent of the center and controls the unconstitutional development including law and order in states so basically through the governor the center can impose article 356 of the indian constitution based on the report of unconstitutional development or the government not following constitutional norms so these are the reasons why national political parties favors centralization and as a conclusion you can write that both national and regional parties constitutes the essence of india's parliamentary system and has ensured continuity of quasi federal politics in india so as you can see this becomes a very interesting question asked by upsc last year based on the politics being practiced by state political parties and also national political parties and also because these political parties ultimately form the government when they win elections now after discussing about political parties and their importance and also their categorization as national and state political parties another question asked by upsc was with respect to this aspect of constitutional morality so the question here was that constitutional morality is rooted in constitution itself and is founded on its essential facets explain the doctrine of constitutional morality with the help of relevant judicial decisions so one part of her answer is with respect to explaining this aspect of constitutional morality which is nothing but the constitutional principles highlighted in the constitution and the second part of your answer would be with respect to important judicial decisions which have ensured constitutional morality and these decisions include sabri mala judgment as it has allowed entry of women in the temple basically upholding the principles of article 25 or fundamental right to religion over social norms the second judgment is about navtej singh johar as the supreme court decriminalized sexual relations between consenting adults thereby upholding the principles of constitutional morality over social morality 
In the case of Nanda Bharati judgment, the Supreme Court came up with this idea of basic structure doctrine which effectively limited the amending powers of the parliament under Article 368 of the Indian Constitution as they cannot amend those parts which can be considered as basic structure of the Indian Constitution, thereby ensuring constitutional morality here also. Further, in SR Bombay, it also declared secularism as part of basic structure and in the Delhi LG vs CM controversy, the court emphasized that the idea of collaborative federalism where both union and states have to work together and collectively to solve common problems and an appointed administrator cannot control every aspect of functioning of an elected government. So overall you can conclude by saying that embracing constitutional morality ensures rule of law, protects rights of citizens and advances social, economic and political justice for the vulnerable sections of the population. So it is important to understand the doctrine of constitutional morality and here you need to go through these judgments again in order to understand this very important doctrine. And here the newspaper also mentions about expression of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar as he expressed his fear by saying that the other is that is perfectly possible to prevent the constitution without changing its form by merely changing the form of the administration and making it inconsistent and opposed to the spirit of constitution. So the question is, can we presume such a diffusion of constitutional morality? Constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated and we must realize that our people have yet to learn it because democracy in India is only a top dressing on Indian soil which is essentially undemocratic. So the words of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar with respect to constitutional morality becomes very significant and constitutional morality has to be nurtured and these important Supreme Court judgments have helped to nurture this very aspect of constitutional morality. Thus this article highlighting all these important facets of Indian constitution and various principles of constitutional morality, the aspect of constitutionalism that is limited government and also the role of opposition and other political parties because ultimately these political parties forms government either at the national level or at the state level. So their role also becomes very important in our democratic setup and this topic becomes important both from our prelims and mains perspective under GS paper 2. Now let's take up this next news appearing on page number 6 in the editorial section and this news mentions about a clean gamble with respect to carbon trading. So it says that carbon trading should help India to accelerate shift away from fossil fuel. So in this news let us understand all the basics with respect to carbon trading or carbon markets. Now carbon markets with respect to its trade comprises of carbon credits and also emission certificate. So let us understand this through an example and let us also go through certain backdrop with respect to the Kyoto Protocol along with Paris Agreement and also this aspect of clean development mechanism. First of all, let us understand how this carbon market work. Now here I have taken examples of two industry, say industry A, for example, Delhi Metro and industry B, for example, industry of steel, cement or fertilizer. Now it's quite obvious that this industry A, that is Delhi Metro, will emit less CO2 or greenhouse gas. Now generally when we talk about emission of greenhouse gas, it is mostly carbon dioxide but there are other greenhouse gas as well. And these other greenhouse gas also mentioned in Annex A of Kyoto Protocol includes carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons and sulfur hexafluoride or SF6. So obviously industry B that is industry of steel, cement and fertilizer will emit more greenhouse gas particularly carbon dioxide as compared to industry A which is Delhi Metro or any other renewable energy which will emit less carbon dioxide. So emission of less carbon dioxide also means less pollution in the atmosphere and because of this they are entitled to carbon credits or in other words they can sell this carbon credit to such industry emitting more greenhouse gases. So effectively these industries who emit more greenhouse gases can buy these carbon credits in lieu of certain money and in the process gets emissions certificate which means that they can emit more. So the idea is to incentivize such industry which is emitting less greenhouse gases and this incentive will be provided by those industries which are emitting 
more greenhouse gases and a mechanism for this exchange has been developed as a part of carbon market where carbon credits are traded and for this purpose emission certificates are provided so this is the basic of carbon market now as i have already mentioned that this aspect of trading of carbon market or trading of carbon credits was provided under the kyoto protocol and similar aspects of trading of carbon market has been provided under article 6 of the paris agreement and the larger idea here is to achieve energy efficiency and also to incentivize such industries which are investing heavily into renewable energy or such other aspects where the emission of greenhouse gases is minimum or very less so after understanding about carbon credits let's go through some of the backgrounds with respect to kyoto protocol now the kyoto protocol generally uses two terms annex b countries who are developed economies or advanced economies and non annex countries basically the developing economies so india is a non annex country according to kyoto protocol so it says that parties with commitment under the kyoto protocol that is annex b countries or the advanced economies have accepted targets for limiting or reducing emissions and these targets are expressed as levels of allowed emission or assigned amounts over two periods first between 2008 to 2012 commitment period that is the first round and between 2013 to 2020 which was the second round so after kyoto protocol paris agreement came into effect and these allowed emissions are divided into assigned amount units or aaus and an assigned amount unit is a tradable unit of 1 metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent now the period of kyoto protocol has ended and now we have entered into the era of paris agreement so other than this it highlights that the other units which may be transferred under this trading scheme each equal to 1 ton of co2 may be in the form of a removal unit an emission reduction unit or a certified emission reduction so a removal unit is basically on the use of land use or land use change or forestry or activity such as reforestation an emission reduction unit is generated by a joint implementation project now a joint implementation project can be carried between annex b countries that is between advanced countries and certified emission reduction generated from clean development mechanism project activity now clean development mechanism under the kyoto protocol were generally ways to reduce greenhouse gas emission by using efficient technologies and this was to take place between annex b countries or advanced countries and between non annex countries or developing economies now it further highlights that countries bound to kyoto targets were to meet them largely through domestic action which was to reduce their emission but can also meet part of the targets through three market based mechanism and reduction of emission through market based mechanisms included emission trading joint implementation and clean development mechanism now joint implementation and clean development mechanism both have been provided under the kyoto protocol However with respect to joint implementation carbon emission or carbon trading can only takes place between annex b countries or advanced countries so it highlights that joint implementation under article 6 of kyoto protocol allows a country with an emission reduction or limitation commitment under the kyoto protocol to earn emission reduction units from an emission reduction or emission removal project in another annex b country each equivalent to 1 ton of co2 which can be counted towards meeting its kyoto targets so joint implementation is between annex b countries whereas clean development mechanism is between annex b countries and non annex countries or developing countries and this aspect has been defined under article 12 of the kyoto protocol which allows a country with an emission reduction or emission limitation commitment under the kyoto protocol basically annex b party to implement an emission reduction project in developing countries and such projects under cdm that is clean development mechanism could earn saleable certified emission reduction credits or carbon credits each equivalent to 1 ton of co2 which can be counted towards meeting kyoto targets so carbon credit is a tradable certificate or permit and one carbon credit is equal to 1 ton of co2 carbon trading is the name given to exchange of emission permits now carbon trading are of two types 
emission trading and offset trading let's understand these two terms so emission trading basically allows countries to sell unused emission units to countries that have exceeded their targets suppose country a has exceeded their target that is it is emitting more greenhouse gases as compared to country b so country b can sell the unused emission units to country a because country b is emitting less greenhouse gas as compared to country a so in emission trading carbon is tracked and traded like any other commodity in a carbon market whereas the other trading is offset trading now let's understand this through another example so here is country a which has constructed a thermal plant of 800 megawatt capacity emitting 400 carbon equivalent in the atmosphere so under this offset trading what this country a needs to do is to establish another or an alternate energy plant say for example wind energy of 800 megawatts which does not generate any amount of emission as an alternative to the thermal plant so since this wind energy plant does not emit any amount of energy hence it offsets the emission emitted by the 800 megawatt of thermal plant so this is an example of offset trading now based on our understanding so far let's take up these two questions asked in 2016 and 2011 the question asked in 2016 was the term intended nationally determined contribution is sometimes seen in the news in the context of options were a pledges made by european countries to rehabilitate refugees from the war affected middle east b plan of action outlined by countries of the world to combat climate change c capital contributed by the member countries in establishment of asian infrastructure investment bank and d plan of action outlined by the countries of the world regarding sustainable development goals here the correct answer was b now this question was regarding carbon credits which one of the following statements is not correct options were a the carbon credit system was ratified in conjunction with the kyoto protocol now this is correct b carbon credits are awarded to countries or groups that have reduced greenhouse gas below their emission quota this is also correct c the goal of carbon credit system is to limit the increase of carbon dioxide emission this is also correct d carbon credits are traded at a fixed price from time to time by united nation environment program now this statement was incorrect so here the correct answer was d because the question was asking which of the statements regarding carbon credits were not correct and these aspect of trading of carbon markets were provided under article 17 of the kyoto protocol now coming to the paris agreement similar aspects have been provided under article 6 of the paris agreement and it also includes aspect of nationally determined contribution so if we go through article 17 of the kyoto protocol it says that the conference of parties shall define relevant principles modalities rules and guidelines in particular for verification reporting and accountability for emission trading and the parties included in annex b countries may participate in emission trading for the purposes of fulfilling their commitments under article 3 and similarly article 6 of the paris agreement allows countries to voluntarily cooperate with each other to achieve emission reduction targets set out in their respective nationally determined contribution So it also means that under Article Six, any country or countries will be able to transfer carbon credits earned from the reduction of greenhouse gas emission to help one or more countries meet climate targets. So just like here, where two industries were exchanging carbon credits with each other, under the Paris Agreement, particularly Article Six, two countries can exchange carbon credits from one to another. Now based on our discussion so far this was the question asked in the prelims of 2016 the question was consider the following pairs term sometimes seen in the news and their origin the terms were annex 1 countries certified emissions reduction and clean development mechanism now certified emission reduction and clean development mechanism could be related to kyoto protocol but according to this pairing the correct answer was 3 so here the correct answer becomes c that is 3 only so these terms mentioned in the news becomes very important from our prelims and also from the mains perspective to understand now aspects of kyoto protocol is still relevant as a question has been asked last year in the mains of 2022 in gs paper 3 the question was discuss global warming and mention its effect on global climate 
explain the control measures to bring down the level of greenhouse gases which cause global warming in the light of Kyoto Protocol 1997. So this question with respect to Kyoto Protocol 1997 and the various mechanisms provided under the protocol to reduce greenhouse gas emissions becomes important. Now let's look into this question asked in 2014. The question was, should the pursuit of carbon credit and clean development mechanism set up under UNFCCC be maintained even though there has been a massive slide in the value of carbon credit? Discuss with respect to India's energy needs for economic growth. So carbon credit, clean development mechanism and other aspects pertaining to Kyoto Protocol is still very important from our examination perspective, both prelims and also mains. And talking about mechanisms provided under Kyoto Protocol, it also mentions about emission trading apart from clean development mechanism and joint implementation. So just like joint implementation, even in emission trading, this trading is done between advanced countries or Annex B countries. So it says that system to sell and buy assigned amount unit among advanced countries to achieve reduction target. So joint implementation and emission trading is between advanced countries or Annex B countries, whereas Clean development mechanism is between developing countries and Annex B countries. So please remember this aspect also from your prelims perspective. Further, under Article 6 of Paris Agreement, the central government has notified the National Designated Authority for Implementation of Paris Agreement under Article 6 with respect to carbon credits or trading of carbon credits. So it says that activities finalized to be considered for trading of carbon credits under Article 6.2 mechanism of Paris Agreement to facilitate transfer of emerging technologies and mobilize international finance in India. In this regard, it says that carbon markets incentivize climate action by enabling parties to trade carbon credits generated by the reduction or removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And this can be done by switching from fossil fuels to renewable energy or enhancing or conserving carbon stocks in ecosystems such as forest. So the following list of activities has been finalized to be considered for trading of carbon credits under bilateral or cooperative approaches under Article 6.2 of Paris Agreement. These includes greenhouse gas mitigation activities, alternate materials and also removal activities. So under greenhouse gas mitigation activities it includes Use of renewable energy with storage, only stored component, solar thermal power, offshore wind, green hydrogen, compressed biogas, emerging mobility solutions like fuel cells, high-end technology for energy efficiency, sustainable aviation fuel, best available technologies for process improvement in hard to abate sectors, tidal energy, ocean thermal energy, ocean salt gradient energy, ocean wave energy and ocean current energy, high voltage direct current transmission in conjunction with renewable energy projects. So all these activities under greenhouse gas mitigation activities has been finalized to be considered for trading of carbon credits. Alternate materials includes use of green ammonia and removal activities includes carbon capture, utilization and storage. So it says that these activities will facilitate adoption or transfer of emerging technologies and may be used to mobilize international finance in India. And the activities will be initially for first three years and may be updated or revised by the nodal authority, namely National Designated Authority for Implementation of the Paris Agreement. So this editorial highlights in details about the carbon market. And it also says that the center is expected to clarify later this year the specifics of carbon trading market in India. So let's wait for the government to specify or clarify this particular aspect or specify carbon trading market in India. So this news becomes very important both from the prelims and mains perspective and in the mains gets covered under GS paper 3 with respect to environment. Now after an elaborate discussion, let's take up the next set of news from prelims perspective. And the first news here is with respect to 13 to 30 pledge, which effectively aims at halting biodiversity loss. And this aspect of 13 to 30 pledge has been highlighted in this news on page number 6 saying that India can become a biodiversity champion. So regarding the 13 to 30 pledge, it says that on 19 December 2022, Representatives of 188 countries have adopted a sweeping agreement to protect the nature at United Nations Biodiversity Conference in Montreal in Canada. 
and the agreement which includes 23 targets aimed at halting the biodiversity crisis including a pledge to protect 30% of the land and 30% of the oceans by 2030 now currently only 17% of land and 10% of oceans are currently considered as protected so the idea is to increase this percentage of protected land and oceans up to 30% by the year 2030 now this conference was chaired by china hosted by canada and it resulted in the adoption of the kunmin montreal global biodiversity framework or gbf on the last day of the negotiations now gbf aims to address biodiversity loss restore ecosystems and protect indigenous rights of the people the plan includes concrete measures to halt and reverse nature loss including putting 30% of the planet and 30% of degraded ecosystems under protection by 2030 it also contains proposals to increase finance for developing countries but this was a major sticking point during the talks now talking about the global biodiversity framework it mainly consists of four overarching global goals to protect nature first halting human induced extinction of threatened species and reducing the rate of extinction of all species tenfold by 2050 second sustainable use and management of biodiversity to ensure that nature's contribution to people are valued maintained and enhanced third fair sharing of benefits from utilization of genetic resources and digital sequence of information on genetic resources and that adequate means of implementation of the global biodiversity framework can be accessible to all parties particularly the least developed countries and small island developing states so these are four overarching goals of the global biodiversity framework so here with respect to 13 to 30 pledge you must know that it is with respect to halting biodiversity loss and the united nations biodiversity conference in montreal has agreed to include 23 targets aimed at halting biodiversity crisis including a pledge to protect 30% of the land and also oceans by the year 2030 now let's take another two topics particularly important from the perspective of location on world map So this news appearing on page number 10 mentions about Israeli envoy defends Haifa port deal with Adani group. So here we need to know about the location of Haifa port and also important ports in Israel, Egypt and Lebanon. Other than this you should also know that how these ports are located either from north to south or from west to east or east to west. So as you can see this is the Haifa port located in Israel. and above this is the beirut port in lebanon and above that is the tripoli port below haifa port is the ashdod port now another important port of egypt is the alexandria port port said and el dekhila port whereas that of lebanon is tripoli port and beirut port so these two ports are in lebanon whereas these ports that is alexandra and el dekhila are in egypt and the port of haifa and ashdod are in israel This question appears on page number 13 and it says that 10 killed scores hurt in Israel's West Bank. Now here you need to know about the location of West Bank, the fact that it does not border Mediterranean Sea but it shares its border with the Dead Sea. Please remember this very important aspect as this particular question was asked in the prelims of 2017. The question was Mediterranean Sea is a border of which of the following countries? options were jordan iraq lebanon and syria now if you look into this map very closely then this is syria and this is lebanon and both these share its border with the mediterranean sea whereas jordan and iraq are not close to mediterranean sea so here the correct options are third and fourth hence c becomes the correct answer that is 3 and 4 only so these locations becomes very important from our prelims perspective Now let's take up the last news appearing on page number 12 and this says that Dickinsonia fossil which was discovered way back in 2020 or 21 which was found in Bhimbetka in Madhya Pradesh is rather an old bee hive and the scientist behind this discovery has suggested that after looking into the various fossils around the world of Dickinsonia fossil they have come to the conclusions that 
the fossil which was believed to be in bhimbetka were not correct as the impression resulted from decay of modern beehive which was attached to a fractured rock surface so actually what was believed as a fossil of dickinsonia which is a very old mammal an animal that lived at least 538 million years ago was believed to be found in 2021 however the recent findings have suggested that it is merely an impression resulted from decay of modern beehive and not that of fossil of dickinsonia now there are various prehistoric cave art or paintings developed about 18000 years ago in bhimbetka and one such cave paintings by prehistoric humans can be seen at bhimbetka rock shelter in the raisin district of madhya pradesh now bhimbetka is india's archaeological treasure and has around 243 rock shelters and have earned the honor of unesco world heritage paintings found in the rock shelters in bhimbetka have a striking resemblance to the ones discovered in kakadu national park in australia to the cave paintings of bushmen in kalahari desert and upper paleolithic lascaux cave paintings in france so this topic also becomes important from your prelims perspective basically with respect to art and culture about bhimbetka caves